a lot of the watch media is so brands driven and it's luxury driven. The luxury brands, well, all brands protect their own image, but they are very careful about the stories they tell about themselves. But if you get the chance to meet someone who's known that brand for a good period of time, you can get a totally different perspective on what that brand's doing, what they've done in the past, what's led them to change things about their watches or not change them, as the case may be. So we have a, a famous guy who's, uh, who's a member and he spent over 20 years collecting Bullover watches. And until he came to our thing, he's never met another watch collector. And he has over 500 of them. We, we had a chap turn up with a 1960s Pepsi GMT Bakelite bezel on his wrist, right? So you're like, okay, this guy is uh, someone who knows his watches and, and has deliberately saved up his pennies for that. Basically the most fragile vintage Rolex you can buy because of the Bakelite dial. So he's, he's chosen that and he's bought that. He said, oh, I just got this two months ago. But the, the watch box he brought with him had a first series, first G-Shock collection in, and he was trying to complete the first series by everything in G-Shock land that counts as a first series. And he was only two away. Hi everybody, welcome back to the Watch Gecko YouTube channel with myself Richard once again coming from the bunker because I'm not in HQ. What's the one thing we probably all have in common? I suspect it's that we're all watch collectors. And this is a perfect segue for me to introduce to you Hamish Robertson, the CEO and co-founder of the Watch Collectors Club. Hamish, thank you so much for giving up some of your time and joining us. Hi Richard, thank you very much for having me on. Um, yeah, I run the Watch Collectors Club, which is a club for everyone who likes watches. We're based in London and we're very excited because next week we're launching our official memberships. I've personally never belonged to a watch collector's club. I've attended red bars and things, but I've never belonged to a club. So the, the prospect of meeting like-minded people on a regular basis actually really excites me. So, I mean, first and foremost, because people are interested, how, how did you get into watches, Hamish? What's your background and what's led us to having this conversation now? Sure. So uh, as a kid, I was one of those kids who always had a watch on. I remember with a lot of fondness, a Timex Iron Man in my teens and an Oakley watch, which nowadays would be quite valuable, I think, but it's plastic, so it's long gone in, in the trash. Uh, for my 18th, my parents very kindly bought me a Tag Voyeur Professional, which I wore with great pride um, all through my student years and my early to mid 20s. And then I was doing pretty well in my career and decided to treat myself to a luxury watch. And I didn't go down to my nearest AD. I actually just went on eBay and started searching. And I'd always loved the Jorge Le Coultre Reverso. So I was looking for Jorge Le Coultre on eBay and didn't buy a Reverso, but I found a mid-century steel time-only Art Deco, Deco dialed watch and bought that for the princely sum of, I think, 600 pounds. And that was the start of my collecting journey because I was so pleased with it. I kept buying more vintage watches. And then I moved to London in 2015 and for work. And in my, my new office, it wasn't long before another chap spotted that I was wearing vintage watches on a regular basis and said, are you a watch guy? And I said, oh, yes, I am. And that chap's now my business partner, Ed Hawkins. And he then said, have you ever been to a watch meetup? And I said, no, what's that? And he took me along to a watch meetup here in London that's been running for a good few years called Time for a Pint, sadly coming to an end at the end of the year, but it's been a great meetup for collectors over the years. And that was the start of my realization that there's a whole community of collectors out there and that there's this huge pleasure to be had from meeting other collectors, hearing their stories, seeing what they have, seeing how, how hearing how they came about it, what research they've done on it, or if, if they're collectors of more modern pieces, just why they chose that one, what they feel about the brand, what they feel about the range, and really getting into what um, is great about the watches um, is what the, the stories people have to tell about them. So then we went to a few more meetup meetups um, and a few boutique events here in London, because of course London is lucky to have so many watch boutiques, which I'll come back to later in terms of how the club, the club can take advantage of that fact. But Ed and I realised that there was a lot of these events that we didn't enjoy. And so in the time on and fashion of why start a business, well, start a business because you want the product that it's going to provide. And that's a different kind of watch event. So a watch event where it being fun and friendly and informative is at the core of what it's doing. And every event, um, you're made to feel very welcome, whatever you're into, whether you are a collector of some of the most magical 
uh, high-end craftsmanship in the world of horology, or you're into Casio G-Shocks and you've got a really interesting number of Timexes in your collection, or you're a microbrand fan and buying really affordable pieces from the microbrand world, we want to create events where all of those people feel welcome. It's not to say we won't have specific events about different parts of the watch world. Of course, that's what we are indeed doing. Um, and people can come along to those if that's what they're interested in. But we've created a, a community and now a club and hopefully a business going forward to really bring as many different kinds of watch events to people as we can so that everybody has something to go to, whatever they're into. And of course, make it about the watches and the people, um, first and foremost. This obviously, you're, you're saying this started obviously as a hobby like the rest of us and then probably similar to myself, you kind of drifted into it as a career. So this is your full-time job now, is that correct? It is. I didn't drift so much as leap. I was fed up with my old job, which was in finance. And I was fed up with almost every aspect of it. And I wanted to try and build something for myself. And also my old job, and this is really important. And I say this because I think you know more people should should think about this if they're fed up of their job, <laughs> is are they actually doing what brings them personally a lot of happiness? So like, sure, my colleagues were great and the money was good. There's no denying any of that. But I wasn't using that in that role. I wasn't able to bring people together. I wasn't able to help inspire people in any way. I wasn't help, able to help people um, learn. And all of these things are things I've always liked to do. And so thinking about what the Watch Club um, can bring for its members and what I wanted a watch club to bring for its members was really that helping people explore the watch world and help people learn more about what they're interested in and that and also help bring people together. So if they're interested in similar things, bring them together so they can really enjoy that together instead of enjoying it on their own because the watch um, collector community has a like an incredible number of people who think that their watch collecting can only be an individual passion. And I've never felt like that because of my personality. So I respect that some people's personality is totally not that. But my personality is I can share my passion and enhance it by helping people enjoy what I enjoy, so the watches in my collection, helping people learn what I've learned and pass that on, and then also helping uh, enjoy it through me learning from them and me seeing their collection. And especially given the variety that we've sort of we know exists in the watch world and the variety we indeed have found from the people who've already come along to our events. And so it was, it was making sure when I chose a new job and when I wanted to build something for myself that it really reflected what I most enjoyed doing. And that is first and foremost, bringing people together to have a good time and then helping them explore and learn more about what they're interested in. In this case, watches. Yeah, it's really interesting because I, 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 what you're saying completely resonates for me as a watch collector. I was very much an individual, as so many of us are. You, you, you immerse yourself in your little collection. And when I came out of a fundamentally different life into Watch Gecko about five years ago, uh, suddenly I was surrounded by like-minded individuals who enjoyed watches. And whilst, of course, I would never advocate the fact that we do anything other than work very hard at Watch Gecko, Generally, when we're in in the morning, there's normally some discussion about what somebody's wearing or what's been released at Watches and Wonders or, or something like that. And it is, it's one of those subjects, one of those passions that is enhanced greatly, isn't it, when you've got like-minded people around you? Yes, and it, it, takes away, it takes the focus away from your own taste and your own knowledge and however much you've invested in, in uh, in your collection, or even if you just have one watch. So if you've spent five years deciding which watch to buy and you're extremely pleased with your purchase, the, the most normal thing to want to do is share that enjoyment and share that pride of, of, of purchase and possession. And that is a deeply human thing. It doesn't make you arrogant. It doesn't make you like, um, you know, an asshole if you're trying to tell someone about your watch because you're pleased that you own it. That's just a deeply human thing to do. And what we want to do is provide more space for people to do that because, you know, lots of people aren't interested in watches. They're interested in other things. And so if you keep going on every day to them about it or every week or, and they don't respond positively, you're going to be disappointed. So it's helping the people who, yeah. who have, don't have that as well to say, it's all right, there's somewhere to go. Watch meetups are a real thing. They're not boring, they're not just the total nerds who are a bit weird, they're for everyone, whatever your level of knowledge, whatever your level of interest, and whatever type of watch you're really interested in. It's a great place to learn as well. 
if you are at the beginning of your journey, one of our watch gecko authors, uh, we, we love his writing because he's right at the beginning of his watch collecting journey. He's 24. Whereas some of the rest of us mm. have been doing it for far too long and we're, we're, we're gray beards and gray hair. And we, it, we always have wonderful conversations with them because we recently had a debate. I, I'm, I'm digressing, which I said I wouldn't do. We recently had a debate about one of the Swiss giants about how we've kind of gone through the tunnel and come out the end of that. He hasn't entered that mm. tunnel yet. And we were trying to advise him what was a good or not thing to do. But it was just fascinating to get these two age demographics together with very, very different points of view. Yeah, totally, totally. And that's a, a good point because a lot of the watch media um, is so brands driven and it's luxury driven. And the luxury brands, well, all brands protect their own image, but they are very careful about the stories they tell about themselves and what they craft about themselves. But if you get the chance to meet someone who's known that brand for a good period of time, you can get a totally different perspective on what that brand's doing, mm -hmm. what they've done in the past, what's led them to change things about their watches or not change them, as the case may be. And yeah. that's, again, even if you're the biggest fan of that brand, meeting someone with that perspective it's hopefully going to be a really enjoyable experience where if your only relationship is with a AD, a salesperson at that brand, or even worse, a succession of salespeople at that brand, that's never going to really allow you the full experience yeah. of those watches, the brand. It's much more interesting to meet other owners and other people passionate about it to see their perspective about the thing you already really like, If we, especially if we're talking about some brands in particular. Um, and that's before you then get onto the detailed knowledge that, in the watch industry, unlike some other industries, it sits in the hands of the uh, owners. So uh, for those who don't know who are listening, you know, the watch um, collector community was like um, took to the Internet in the late 90s, like the happiest bunch of people ever, because they could now had a way to share knowledge around the world from all these people who built knowledge themselves in, in, in various places because they were so passionate about brands or a model of watch, you know, like the Speedmaster or the Submariner, you know, people have built these amazing databases of, of information. And then in the 90s, they could put them all online and find each other. And, and none of that information came from the brands. It was all carefully collected by consumers. And you can compare that from to an industry like wine, where the industry has all these experts, you know, called mm. uh, sommelier, you know, and wine merchants. And they're everywhere. And they all educate themselves about wine. And but the, the watch industry doesn't do that. It has a a load of salespeople who've, who've attended a small handful of training schemes uh, and maybe get to go to the factory and maybe get to go on a couple of other courses and that's it. Um, <laughs> and then you have right. dealers who educate themselves uh, and hopefully the dealers are honest and educate themselves with, the, with, with have very high quality information, but it's hard even for them, uh, especially about uh, brands outside the top 15 or 20. It's very hard. And so... The, the watch world needs its community. Um, it's all about the owners. It's all about the collectors who have all of the perspective and information that, that you might want. And so we're, our goal is to help keep bringing these people together. And that's why we're so um, clear in all of our, our, our messages about our events is that they're there to be informative. We're not there just to have a few drinks and try on a watch. We're there to all of us are there to learn something while we're there, whatever type of event we're doing. That's our, our mission. Sure. And, and our goal, my goal, and Ed's goal as the people producing these events is can we get something into the event that even the most experienced collector who's come along is going to learn something new? Now, obviously, we're not going to manage that every time, but we do really try. Um, uh, while at the same time making sure it's accessible to anyone who's there for the first time, just approaching the brand for mm -hmm. the first time. Um, and I'm pleased to say we, we're doing all right so far on that front. You know, we are... Um, getting great feedback from people who've been collecting for decades as well as people just starting out. So we really want to help help people find a home where whatever they're doing, they're comfortable um, coming to us for help, asking questions of, other, uh, of the other members they meet at, at our events. And then, of course, if they, they want to, if they come to an event with a brand with us and they start building a relationship with a salesperson, or a brand representative or a brand expert, then they can keep asking those questions afterwards, mm -hmm. after the event, but we've helped introduce them. Um, and that's also our goal when we work with the brands. Listening to what you're saying there, there's a, a direct parallel almost to what we do, for example, in the magazine here or on the YouTube channel, because mm. we try and 
uh, find a balance. And sometimes it's very difficult to find a balance with the fact that we know that if there's 10,000 people listening to this video, it's there's going to be people that have no idea what, uh, very little watch knowledge. And there are people who are going to know far more than you or I do. And finding that balance is very hard. But I imagine it's even more difficult when you've actually got people face to face and you've got that one to one direct contact. So if, if you're if you're achieving it, I'd say that's probably quite impressive, to be honest. I think a couple of things. I think what we're trying to do with our events is create the atmosphere where people can then tell us what more they need or the right people are there for them to ask, um, including from the other attendees. So, you know, we again, we do have people who have really deep knowledge of certain brands mm. come to those brand events. Um, we had an interesting event with, with Watchfinder on where we said it was about the Submariner. And as you say, so when I'm giving a talk about the Submariner, what do I put in it from the entire history of the Submariner? And so it's simply my job to put a couple of things in that may be a little bit rarer pieces of information that, that someone who does know the model very well can remember. But at the same time, just absolutely hit the basics of why the Submariner is so popular. <laughs> and so the people who are new to watches or new to that, that watch or new to Rolex or whatever, they're like, oh, okay, I kind of understand now a bit more about why the Submariner is so popular. And then hopefully the people who uh, did know a lot about the Submariner, I got a couple of things in there that, that yeah. might have been new to them or they might have forgotten. They'd learned it once and forgotten yeah. it. And so that's how I try to think about it. I also think at the events, Ed and I are very conscious of how successful YouTube is in the watch community. And there's many amazing resources on YouTube, but they are all broadcast. So the watch world has found its, its, its broadcasting medium and that's fine, but they are, they are all, you know, the best you can do is comment along in the comments and have a discussion in the comments. Absolutely. And we feel that the next step, the next step is in, is basically enhanced events. So events where people learn from other people and, and multiple people rather than, you know, listening to the YouTube, maybe replaying something if you don't quite understand or you forgot. And that's why we want to take that step. I mean, we could have just three years ago launched a YouTube channel, but we didn't. We've always been really focused on, we have a YouTube channel, but we're really focused on events first. That's the heart of the club. And that's so that other the members can all meet each other and learn from each other and explore the watch world together. And I think a point you, you raised a little while ago, which I think is really good, is that there is this, uh, this element of human nature that if you do know a lot about a subject, it's, it's um, inbred into us all to want to impart that knowledge to other people. And mm -hmm. your club obviously is giving the ones that do know a little more the, the, the wonderful opportunity to do that to the people who are at the beginning of the journey. Absolutely. And it's, it's very interesting how it's sort of working. So actually what's happening far more is the people who know a lot about one corner of the watch world are getting to tell people who are telling people who know a lot about another corner of the watch world about that. So we've got one digital collector who's come down a few times and people find that absolutely fascinating. You know, how does collecting digital watches work, which is quite different because he in effect repairs them all himself, which very few people try with their mechanical watches. Some yeah. people do, of course, but very few people actually do. Whereas he says, no, this is kind of how, how it has to work because I have to buy a few and sort of make make them a bit more perfect. And that's actually normal in the, more normal in the digital watching community. And people find that fascinating. We have a, a famous guy who's uh, who's a member and uh, hopefully going to sign up next week. He's, he's a real regular because he spent over 20 years collecting bullover watches and until he came to our thing, he's never met another watch collector. And he has uh, over 500 of them. And they are only men's time only bull over watches wow. from the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. He doesn't have any chronographs. He doesn't have any electric or electronic bull over watches. None of those. He only has the style he likes. And what he's taken to doing is bringing one watch box with six watches in along each time. And there are six different watches every time. And it's now he's a regular. Everybody else knows he's a regular. So everybody goes to see what Steve's brought this time. And they're all a very, very particular type of watch. But we're now seeing this very regular uh, enjoyment about hearing the stories behind these ones. Did you get this one for a bargain? How long did it take you to find this one? Is there something special? And of course, there are some very rare and very special watches in that collection that he's able to talk about. And, and it's 90% and of 
the people interacting with that watch um, because of the style of watch was he's never going to own it. They're never going to own that watch. Yeah. They're never interested in owning it. But they're getting so much out of just hearing about it and hear, hearing about Steve's collecting. Um, and that's that's amazing as well. It's, it's, it's the opposite of, oh, here's a guy with a huge watch collection. Is that boring? It, it's, it's never going to be boring when that's how it's sort of being presented to people and how uh, that, that member is enjoying bringing his collection to life. I, I think that's wonderful. So let's just say that, I mean, I'm a huge World War II watch fan. I love the American A11s mm -hmm. from the 1940s. I'm guessing Steve's probably got one because Bulova made, almost made one. If I wanted to see Steve's Bulova, how do I come to one of your events? Where where can I find you? Yeah, so you can find us at thewatchcollectorsclub.com and on Instagram at thewatchcc. And what we're doing is after we launch next week, we're saying that anyone can come to three events for free, any any of the events that are on the website, you can sign up with your name and email address. Uh, we'll, you know, we send out the venue details the day before, unless it's at a, at a store. But you can come along, um, we'll say hello, you can say, hi, I'm coming for the first time. We'll say, yeah, we'll, we'll register you because we'll, we'll re we register everyone who comes along. Um, you can try us two or three times. And after that, we'll say, look, if you'd like to keep coming to the events, please join us as a member. And we've got two membership tiers. Um, the goal here is to be absolutely uh, as accessible uh, and affordable as we possibly can because we're a club for everyone. We're not a luxury watch club. We're a club for everyone who loves watches. So our first tier we're calling the steel tier um, with our, our the most obvious watch-related tier naming we could get because we've got steel and gold. Um, so the steel tier is only £75 a year. And for that, you'll get access to all of the meetups we run. So all of our evening meetups, which are every month in London, our brunch meetups, which are a weekend brunch for people who can't do uh, weekday evenings, uh, also in London at the moment, our online meetups where we do an online talk. So I give a talk to ten, for 10 to 15 minutes once a month, and then we chat about the topic afterwards. So the one coming up in September is Brightling Chronographs. So um, I'll talk about Brightling Chronographs because they have such an incredible history of them, and then we'll just talk about chronographs. 45 minutes um, and that's on zoom so that's really accessible wherever you are um, and then we will um, anything like the watch shows that we go to they'll be available for booking and then you'll get access to four of our retailer events per year so that's the steel tier and we also get partner benefits and um, educational resources but i'll come back to them a bit later and then our gold tier uh, is all that all, all the steel tier gets, but you can come to an unlimited number of events. So if you uh, think you're going to come to, um, you know, quite a few of our retailer events as we get them organized, then gold tier is for you. And also our more exclusive events with partners. So if a retailer uh, is able to put on something really interesting and say, look, we can only take a group of five or six, then those events will be available to the gold members. And we've got some really interesting um, sort of things in under discussion with certain brands that would, that are, are, you know, I don't like to use the word, word exclusive because this is not an exclusive club, but we're already at the stage where we're being offered some very exclusive opportunities from certain brands and they'll be available to the gold tier members. Okay. So, and I don't think I've set the price. So we've kept the pricing really simple. So steel is 75 pounds a year and gold is 150 pounds a year. Okay. Understood. So, the membership gives you real FaceTime access and online access, depending on your availability. Um, you've mentioned London a few times. Uh, let's just say uh, Richard up in the Derbyshire Dales wants to join. Obviously, there's the electronic medium. Have you any plans to take the club on the road, so to speak? Yes. So it's a chicken and egg problem, as with any events business. <laughs> you want to know that you've got demand um, before you you know, spend too much money going to host events elsewhere. But this year we've got an event at Fears HQ in Bristol on October the 4th. So we, Fears came to our, our British Watch Design event in May and they're coming again to our British Watch Design event in November. And they said, we'd love you to come to our headquarters in Bristol and do an event. We said, fine, um, we'll do our best to attract people, but you, you can also invite your, your clients and friends. So that's what we're doing with Fears. Next year, however, what we hope to do is take our British watch design uh, event and idea on the road. Um, so these are basically a mini watch show, but 
with an added educational component. Uh, and we'll hope to do that um, in at least one more, but hopefully two more places around England. It all depends on everybody's calendar and the brand's calendar. And then it would it would literally be if we have demand. You know, I've said to people before. I was chatting to people who've already got watch groups in different parts of the country on Instagram. I said, if you can get at least fifteen people, like I'll come to wherever you are and run the right. event. So that's kind of what. As we keep growing, we'll kind of keep saying we'll start saying that to people that we can probably make this work. You know, and for a lot of people. Um, what we know is people are really hesitant to, you know, do all the organization and, and all the, the logistics of running events and people get very, um, find it very difficult to, to do that. And then they get very worried that no one will show up and things like that. So we will take that on for people. If they're confident that there's, there's a group of them that would be that many, then we'd be happy to go around the UK. Um, but otherwise, we'll try and do these shows. And then we've said to the brands, because the brands are very interesting as well, the ones who we work with a lot, like Bremont, they've said, oh, can you, because we did Birmingham for Bremont last year, can you come back to Birmingham? I said, well, we're not sure that we have that many people on our mailing list from Birmingham, so we need to keep growing a bit. But when we do, we'll come back. Well, it all sounds really interesting. And uh, my mind is already thinking, is there a possibility to do a night in Tewkesbury? Uh, watch Gecko. Yeah, I mean, nope. if if we think we could get a really good bunch of people, like I'm very happy to come and host it. I'll need to have a word with the boss. What 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 is it for the club? Well, the club is basically showing people what a really great watch event can be, and and so whoever wants to host that, I can work with them to do that. And the economics, as I said, are quite straightforward. Really, I'm I'm happy to travel if we're going to get fifteen or more people and have a really great. Night. We did a night in Cheltenham. Um, for Watch Gecko and uh, Gakota and Zulu Diver, all of the brands that come under the Gakota yeah. Group umbrella, and it was it was a great night. It was a really good night. We 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 had twenty thirty people there, some local watch press, um, general people of interest, the authors, past and present. It was uh, it was a great success. So I think um, I think as I say, leave that one with me. Dot dot dot. We'll we'll. we'll talk outside video on that one, but it sounds quite exciting to me. Um, you also briefly mentioned, I think when we were chatting was watch fairs. Um, mm -hmm. Hey, sort of, how do you feel about watch events? Cause we've got huge ones. We've just, we've got sh one in Geneva. It's just happening now. We've got Shanghai coming up. We've got the big one in London at Heathrow terminal five world time, which we're exhibiting at as well. Um, a, how do you feel about those? And B, would you consider ever having a stand at them to promote the club? Yes, to the latter. Again, it's all about like when's the right time for us. So we, you know, we just consider that on a month by month basis almost. Watch events are very interesting because for that again, for those who are watching who don't know, they come out of the fact that this is a wholesale retail industry. So big watch fairs are historically for retailers to go and try and decide which watches to put in their shop. So if you were a jeweler and you wanted to look for a new brand, for some reason you would go to the watch trade show, uh, talk to a load of brands, decide which one was going to go in your shop window. They were never about the end buyer, historically. Um, but the world's changed. And so now the end buyers want a lot more from the brands. And I think it's fair to say that there's still a bit of tension between those two uh, attendees. Um, and there's tension between the role of the press, the media journalists and insiders as well. Um, which is you know, a huge area of, of debate in the watch collector community and watch bias community, you know, how, how they should think about watch journalism. So I, I haven't been to any of the big, big ones, and that's because of the pandemic. So I haven't been to Geneva, I didn't go this year, I probably will go next year. But for me, I'm kind of like, well, what do I go for when I live in London? Because I can see everything that I would see at Geneva um, in terms of the big brands in London. Uh, so I probably, if I do go, I'm going to spend a lot of time at the side fairs to see all the independents um, and things like that and learn more about them and what that part of the Swiss industry. So that's my immediate thought is for me and with both my business and personal hat is what do I learn if I go to that kind of thing? So we've got a few watch fairs, as you said, coming up in London. So what I do for the club is I've said, to our members, like, you can come with us. So if you've never been to one and you don't know what happens uh, okay. and you're a bit like, I don't have anyone to go with, we'll be there. And if you meet us here at this time, 
we'll take you out. Come around with us. So that's our club offering, as well as you know a discount for tickets and things like uh, Watch Pro. Um, and so that's the first thing is if you don't know what a watch fair is about, you don't know whether you're going to enjoy it, just come with us. Worst case is like you chat to us for a bit and go home. Well, that's absolutely the worst thing that's going to happen to you, right? So that's the first thing we can offer. The second thing we think about is if I know in advance who's at a fair, over time, I want to help all the people in the club who like that kind of thing know that the fair's on and that they could go and see that type of watch or that brand. So I want I want the club to be a place where people just by nature think, oh gosh, which fairs are coming up? Oh, and oh look, that's going to be at that fair. Okay, that's the fair I'm going to go to this year. So as the UK fairs build back up again with Watch Time now running annually, then we've got Watch Pro running annually in November. Um, then we've got the new one from the Alliance of British Watch and Clockmakers um, coming up in March. So then we've got the Two and Twenty, I think it's now called, which is in the Midlands. Um, and then we've got whatever we do. And then we've got the Red Bar Brighton one in September. So as these things happen, I want to make sure that the Watch Collectors Club is helping everybody understand why they should go. And the reason you should go is because you can try on more watches in a short space of time than you can anywhere else, other than maybe an airport duty free. So you, you, should, you should go to Watch Fair Absolutely. to see watches you've never seen, see watches you've never seen before, Try on brands you've never heard of. <laughs> Literally, go to the fair, seek out brands you've never heard of once in your life, and try one of their watches on. You know, things like that is what I think. Why I think people should go. Like, sure, can you go to the Watch Pro Salon in November and have an amazing time at the Seiko and Grand, the Grand Seiko stand? Yes, of course you can, and you should if you like that brand and those watches. But you should also just make sure you try on things you've never seen before, never heard of before, and and talk to the people because those people are going to be so passionate about that brand because they know that's their chance to impress you. So that's, that's how I think about them. And when I think about how we can add as the club to that model, because we're not here to help connect um, brands and retailers, that's not going to be our job ever, probably. So we will then add an, an educational component because the current people who produce these fairs find that very difficult because their main customer is the brand uh, and not the collector. Um, they quite correctly spot that if they have panels of talks in a different room, if they have other things going on on the side of the fair, if they have non-watch brands over there, then they're taking away from the um, brands who are their main customer and letting them talk to people about watches. Mm. So we're going to find a way to enhance uh, the experience of the end customer. So what we did in May with our British design event, which was just an evening event with um, Fears Watchers, Schofield Watch Company and Studio Underdog, is I interviewed each of their um, designers about their design just for 10 minutes. So we did stop everything. We said, everyone who wants to listen, come in here. Just a quick 10 minutes. And that provided a lot of value because it gave this amazing insight um, into how the, the watches that we were looking at were designed. But also because those three brands, which you all know, Richard, are really quite different watches, um, it gave an amazing contrast. So we felt, and we got feedback to the extent that by adding that little bit extra of, of informational content, um, by doing it in an interview format, which kept it super chilled and super relaxed, but adding that little extra really added the context to the watches that people were looking at that evening. So that's what the Watch Collectors Club's gonna to look to do with all our fair type events, is think of some new formats, some new ways to do it, to really add that little bit extra so that the people attending who are the watch lovers and watch buyers, hopefully, um, as far as the brands are concerned, they walk away saying, okay, God, that, you know, I didn't just try on some watches. I didn't just see some watches. But when I went to the Watch Collectors Club night, the Watch Collectors Club fair, we also have, they also have that going on. And that was really interesting and really helpful. And that's what we want to do in yeah. the future if we can. I think that's wonderful. I think that's really adding value. I mean, certainly I could say unequivocally that, that if the, the, the London event that's coming up in a couple of weeks, if, if you said to me, Richard, can we, can I bring our uh, guests, our, our, our members, to the Kokota stand at 6 p.m.? And could you give everybody 15 minutes speech on why you developed the Special Forces watch, the Kokota Phalanx? That would make our day. And I think I could speak for every other brand mm -hmm. that's there. If you went to Marcus, uh, sorry, Raphael, sorry, and, and Marcus at Formex, they'd welcome it. Any of the guys would love that because 
a lot a lot it is you're right it is a bit intimidating to go to some of these things on your own and to, to walk up to these big booths where there's there's grumpy people behind the stand with loads of watches and you want to ask some questions but if there's a group of you i think it's a lovely way to do it um hamish i applaud you that's a really good idea and i can only speak for gakota but if you turn up with us we would welcome your members okay no thank you and i i think it's we're here we you know i say this you know i don't i i say this with, with the absolute most simple fact i do not care what watchers my member members like and i do not care what they're into what i care about is is them finding what they're into and enjoying that at the show <laughs> and so for me the big failure is if if someone goes to a watch show and as you say it's too intimidated to speak to people at a certain stand because it's busy or the way the brand is uh, is displaying itself um is is a different style that they're that they're used to and able to access but they are really interested. That is like the bridge that I'm trying to cross personally and for the, the club. The club is there to cross that bridge for the brand and the customer. And the in, because, the, again, the industry is, of course, driven by the biggest brands. And we all know who the biggest brands are and they're luxury brands. And when, you, when you're a luxury brand, then, especially if you're really old, <laughs> You used to do things very differently to maintain your air of exclusivity. And you used to have very different attitude to what is now normal in the way brands treat their customers. And there's a lot of legacy of that in the industry. And it's nobody's fault. It's nobody's fault and it's not deliberate. Like It's just how the industry has shaped itself over the last uh, 120 years since wristwatches became a thing, right? Um, and before that, when, when pocket watches were sold in the way they were sold. So, so that's... That's why brands can be off-putting, even if they don't expect to be, even if they've gone to a watch show to try and talk. And the same for new brands. So new brands might be absolutely full of enthusiasm and have these, as you said, big displays with things all over them. And they're a bit busy. And someone might just think, oh, I'll go there later. I'll go there later. I'll go there later. And then never get back to that stand um, because they're, they're a bit intimidated or put off by it in that moment. And again, to me, that's a shame. Um, it's not the brand's fault. It's not the customer's fault. It's just, oh gosh, it's a hot brand. They're doing a lot well. There's a lot going on. I'm going to miss out. I don't want that to happen. So can you add um, things around a fair, things around an event where you say, look, and this is what we do with our retail events. So we were at Tag Heuer for the first time uh, this summer. And they said, look, we're doing this. It's our year for the Carrera, you know, with the anniversary and the new new editions. I said, brilliant. So I'll talk about the Carrera. And, you know, I've, I I go to these brands and they say, we're going to do an event and I'm going to talk about your watch. Is that okay? And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Re oh okay. Well, can you tell us what you're going to say? And I'm like, of course I can. Because if you when you see what I'm going to say, you'll see that it is entirely about putting the watch in context. Because Tag Heuer and their massive marketing campaign was designed over the last three years, all ready for this. Blah, blah, blah. And it all does what they want it to do for their reasons. And that's fine. That's, that's their area of expertise, selling watches. And so when we go, that's their, that's their job. The salespeople can reflect the, the messages about the watch. They can tell people the technical specs. And I'm going to say, okay, here's where the Carrera came from. Here's what it looked like first. Here's how it changed. Here's why it disappeared for 10 years. Here's what happened when it came back. Here's what's happened over the last uh, 20, nearly 30 years since it came back. Lots of change because of these different things going on at Tag Heuer at the time. But now look, they're going back to where it started. You can see the direct inspiration of design. Here's the picture of the first one. Here's the picture of the current ones. And now let's, if you haven't already, let's all go and try this on. So you can just fix that in your memory. Is this the kind of watch I want? Classic inspired racing chronograph. Tag Heuer is colorful, so we've got colors this year. And that is me then helping bridge that gap. So if you came along and you knew a lot about TAG, but you'd never cared about the Carrera because it's not your style of watch, then at least you've come and thought, oh, that's interesting. I, I didn't quite realize what happened to TAG in that period. And gosh, that one from the 60s was beautiful, but I'd never wear it. And yeah, the, the ones today, I can see that I still think they're beautiful, but again, not for me. If that's what you take away, then great. If you're just new, new to, to watches and you, obviously you've heard of TAG Heuer because it's such a big brand and you come along and you go, gosh, maybe you'll go, I didn't know that. Tag Heuer had a watch as iconic as that that's gone back so many years and I'm going to take a closer look you know so it's connecting those those 
different things about what the brand's trying to do, why they're trying to do it. It's not for me to say whether they're doing the right thing. It's what are they doing? How can I help people understand it? And then people can make their own decisions. They can build relationships with the salespeople and they can maybe, if they want, you know, make a purchase or just buy a vintage one <laughs> because yeah, I've inspired them to look at a uh, vintage yeah. tag. So. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, because, I mean, uh, one of the huge brands that I'm, I'm on, I've had a few and um, it's it's unfortunate. It's the brand that people often now say, I love it, but I wouldn't buy another. So I think we all knew who we're talking about. And it's... Uh, they, they appealed to a very specific customer demographic in the 1980s and 90s when I was really into them. And I, I feel that demographic isn't really looked after now. But I get it. They've evolved their marketing. They have to. Um, I always love it when I end up speaking to younger people who only see the new perspective. And then in the same room, you get the older guys like me, you see the older perspective. And it's it's great how the two halves can then sort of kind of like, like you were saying, kind of bring each other together again a bit. And you, you come away, actually, it restores your faith in the brand a bit. You, you become a bit enthused again, and you just need that different perspective. And it led me on to thinking that for your events, do you ever have to, if we drill down the, 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 the phrase community a bit, do you feel you might run specialist events, say for female or um, under £1,000 or military or specialist? Is there any plans to do more specific, um, you know, events? Uh, yes. So my dream is to get so large we can do unbelievably specific events. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. um, so the larger we get, the more we know about our members, the more we can say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna do the 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 event about different types of, of you know chronograph cam movements right <laughs> so so if we if we get there um, I will be absolutely delighted um, what we found uh, oh, I I should mention we've already run events solely for women so we recognise and I can I tell I'm very open about this that this is one of the most male dominated um, communities. Uh, you know, in, in collecting. And sure it doesn't surprise anyone. It's entirely because of culture and um, and tradition. It's nothing to do with anything deliberate. And it's not anything to do with any watch collectors who, who try and exclude women. And I don't think that's ever been the case. Um, so what we've done is we've tried to advertise events solely for women where Ed and I, the, the co-founders, are the only men in attendance. And they've, they've, we've had quite a good bit of interest, um, but they've been small. Uh, and then at our regular meetups, we average one women, woman in attendance. So that's our average. So some right. events we have more than that, but the average one. And I've our um, current mailing list, um, if you scan just names on the mailing list and try and make a few educated guesses about women's names, it's running at about 12%. So we're very open with where we are. What we think is that there's far more women out there who are really interested in watches than have ever been properly communicated to by any part of the watch media landscape or the watch events landscape. And I'm not just talking about women who like beautiful ladies' watches from, from the jewellery brands. I'm talking about just women who like all the different kinds of watches and sure. have a huge interest. And I think they're very poorly communicated to, and we will could keep trying to find different ways of reaching those women. And that's something we're going to continue. And then if we get special events or invitations from certain brands who want to focus on the watches in their lineup that are more suitable for women for whatever reason, um, then we'll be deliberately, you know, messaging everyone we know who who is a woman who might be interested. And then if there's any men who are interested in those, they can they come along as well. So that's definitely one we're really going to push on um, even if it remains very small uh, for the time being, because because it's so it's it's so interesting why women don't see that collecting as something that's for them, or you know, it's like another stage back in confidence in being a, a public collector for so many women. And when we talk to them, like their fears are obvious. Like, well, am I just going to go to an event full of really boring men? And it's like no, because our events no. aren't boring at all, even if, <laughs> even if they are full of men. <laughs> um, I, I, no, I hear yeah. you. It's one of, we've just recruited one, uh, one of our first female authors onto the magazine. And she's just wonderful, uh, really passionate, hugely yeah. knowledgeable, brings a totally different perspective because her, her thoughts on an Omega Speedmaster might be slightly different to mine. Uh, I, we love it. We embrace it. Um, 
Talking of specific watches, so I'm just gonna I'm gonna put Hamish on the spot now, not the world the, the watch collecting club. Um we are obviously both collectors, you and I. That that's obvious as now. There will be people who want to know. Hamish, what is Pride of Place in your collection at the moment? I think my favourite and most interesting watch is my Jeux Le Coultre Futuromatic, which is from the 1950s, um, which has a very advanced automatic movement in it. It's I'm lucky enough to have its 18 karat gold. Um, it's symmetrical because it doesn't have a crown on the side. It's, it's, it has a crown for setting the time, not winding the time, and that's on the back. So very unusual in that sense, but it makes the whole aesthetic very, very pleasing to the eye. Um, I'm mostly a vintage collector then with a few modern, I mean, this is a, uh, for those who know it, an Alpinist Ginza edition with a special dial. Um, and, you know, I, I really, I'm design first. I'm not a movements guy. I don't remember movement numbers. I don't care that I don't remember movement numbers and I never will. Um, so it, it's, um, and I'll, I'll never remember them or care about remembering them. So just to, just in case anyone's wondering what my vibe is in the club, I talk about what everyone's watch looks like. And I talk about the story behind it and the, the owner's story. I don't talk about, very rarely talk about the, the, the technology inside it. But I'm very interested in some types of watch technology, you know, complications and that. But what we found, to your point about special events, is, is it's most people are interested in design and brand. Um, there's very much lower interest in movements and technology than we expected. But again, the more members we have, the more that will grow because we will have people who come along who are very interested in it. But that's been an interesting learning over the last couple of years. And then my sort of grail collection, I just, I have so many watches I love. <laughs> so <laughs> so it, Don't it, we if all? I won the lottery, it would be a very, a very big shopping day or week ahead. <laughs> I'll carry your bags. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm so lucky because this is my job now and I live in London, so I can go and see watches a lot um and i I see the watches our members bring and they're just just some of you know such fascinating timepieces and and such quirky timepieces as well um one of our our female members came along and she's an engineer by trade and she came (laughs) she came along uh both the last two times she's come along with two new watches because she's in a bit of a bit of a i can't stop myself buying mode but she came along with you know the two two really interesting swatches um, both completely different, even in the swatch canon. And everybody was like, that's an unusual swatch. And everyone was like, but I kind of like it. And she was like, yeah. I know, <laughs> that's why I had to buy them. There's, there's that, that to me is, is really exciting to me as well. I, I, I'm so enthusiastic and excited about still everything out there that, that almost my collecting is, is the back burner. My job is, is collecting. Uh, watches in just in a different way, and I think what's great as well is the message that you've really delivered um, is is that it's not an elitist thing. I think that's so important. Uh, case in point, uh, I recently bought my first, almost embarrassed to admit it, my first Casio F ninety one W. Wow, what an mm-hmm. icon! I love it. I loved it so much. I expounded about it so much in the office that the office now collectively owns about six F ninety one W. And then I went online and I found a guy that had an attache case with every F91W or a derivative of that he'd collected. And these these watches started from £6.99. And admittedly, they got a little bit more expensive as they became a bit more unusual, but we're still not talking crazy mm-hmm. money. This collection blew me away. Absolutely amazing. What I'd give mm-hmm. to meet that guy. And I think that's that's what I think your club is delivering, that... that that, that it is for everybody. It's completely holistic. Yeah. We, we had a chap turn up. Sadly, he's only he's not come back since that meetup um, because he's, he's got so many other commitments. But he turned up with a um, Pepsi G, 1960s Pepsi GMT Bakelite bezel on his wrist. Right? So you're like, okay, this guy is uh, someone who knows his watches and, and has deliberately saved up his pennies for that. Now they're so expensive. Um, fragile Rolex. For those who don't know, it's basically the most fragile vintage Rolex you can buy because of the Bakelite dial. So he's, he's chosen that and he's bought that. He said, oh, I just got this two months ago. But the, the watch box he brought with him had a first series, first uh, G-Shock collection in. And he was trying to complete the first series, like everything in G-Shock land that counts as a first series. And he was only two away. 
So I think he had like nine out of 11 or 11 out of 13 G-Shocks in this box that were all 40 years old. Wow. And all of them were working. And I was like, whoa, that is so cool. Like I was a <laughs> G-Shock fan myself. Yeah. But again, just to be like, you've got a like, literally like a few months after launch G-Shock and it's still wow. working. Um, so yeah, awesome. That's um, fabulous. Look, um, if we draw this to a close now, and I think the very important thing is that we get across. I do, I do, I do want to just just wanted to yeah. mention the, the member benefits that we organised. So yeah, go for it. Um, many of you will know from being other types of club that you you know clubs often work hard to try and find benefits for members, and we've done that, and we'll keep doing that. So we've got discounts on uh, at places like Watch Gecko, who very generously given us a fifteen percent uh, discount um, for all, all members, and you only get that if you sign up. Um, as, a, as, a, as a paid member, but then you'll get that discount for everything that Watch Gecko um, have, uh, have on their site. And we'll, we've got other, other types of benefits, so for magazines, for um, watch boxes and such like, for books, um, and again, for show tickets for places like Watch Pro Salon coming up in November. So and we'll, I'll keep working hard to find new benefits to add to that platform. So that comes, if, comes with your membership as well. And then we're building a... We've just called it a learning center, which makes it sound like like it's not the best name, but um, our goal is education. So that's that's going to be in the end quite a big, deep page of resources for people um, mm -hmm. because the watch world is is scattered across the entire internet. <laughs> so yeah, sure. um, I'm I'm going to I've built up a thing that will be there from next week, and then we'll just keep adding to it. Hopefully, we'll get members to suggest things to add. So that'll be a place to go if you need some um, obscure information or if you just want to learn like a really definitive and great article about the history of wristwatches, you know, there's one there. And yeah, sure, we've written a bit about it on our blog, but here's one that's just 1,500 words that's excellent. So we're putting that kind of thing there as well so you can just go there and spend hours um, exploring. Thank you so much for giving Watch Gecko a little bit of your time. Can I ask you one more thing? Can you promise to come back and tell us how it's going in a couple of months? I'd love to do a follow-up. I'd love to, yeah, that'd be great. Excellent, okay. Thank you again for your time. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is Richard signing off on behalf of the Watch Gecko YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, the magazine, and the podcast, and we'll come back very soon with some more wonderful watch-related content.